Hey guys, Kurt Wilson, Beats on Bytes. Today I'm talking to Bobby Ozinski. Uh, Bobby Ozinski is an author, recording mixer, uh, engineer, musician. Uh, he's done a ton of things, got some great stories, and uh, fascinating, fascinating. Uh, been around a long time and known a lot of things. So uh, sit down and enjoy. Grown up in uh, every era of uh, the change in music formats. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you were you were here for singles, you were here for albums, you were here for stereo, you were here for quad, uh, DAT, mini discs, eight track cartridge, cassettes, everything. Um, how did that impact you as far as uh, producing and engineering music and writing music and working with people, or did it? Well, you know, when new technology changes, you roll with it. And that's exactly what happened with me with ADATs. You know, I bought some ADATs and I did a lot of recording uh, on that format and D88s and whatever. So, um, you know, it's all a budget about budgets. If you didn't have budgets and you had to do it cheaply, and that was the way to do it cheaply. So I did a number of albums that way, I have to say. Um, you know, when I couldn't afford, you know, a bigger studio. And wanted to play, you know, with the mixes later or whatever. So I was into that like everybody else. Um, one of the best albums I ever worked on was called Once in a Blue Moon by Jerry Groom. And uh, Jerry was a protege to a uh, guitar player from the Allman Brothers. Dwayne Allman? Dwayne, yeah. Okay. He was Dwayne's protege, so he was pretty fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the... Um, the gist of this is it was a brand new studio. It didn't have a multi-track yet. So we recorded it. We had the dates already set. So we recorded it live to DAT, live to stereo. Awesome. And it was actually fantastic the I'll way it, it turned out. It, it was, um, you know, up for Grammy and all that stuff. So probably captured a lot of energy, right? Yeah, it was really great. And it just goes to show you that, you know, it's not always technology. Now, it's a, you bring me to a great point. So with everybody in the world has a, a computer and a studio in the computer now. It doesn't mean they know how to use it. And, yeah. and that's one of the things I'm really thankful for your courses. I got to tell you, I mean, I've, I've uh, managed recording studios and owned recording studios, you know, all over uh, L.A. And I still learn stuff from you. And it's, yeah. it's fantastic. No, and I appreciate that because I think too many people think, well, this is the way I do it and this is how it sounds and all that, but I keep wanting to get better. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I seek those things out. I go on YouTube and all that kind of stuff and see what people are doing in the new plugins and all that, because why not? You know, it's, it's, if, if you're not learning, you're not, you're not moving forward. Yeah. But I appreciate your courses because they really, they tend to not speak down to anybody and they also don't assume you know anything. So you're, you're very comprehensive as far as this is how I do it, this is the reason why, and these are the results I get, let me know what you get. And, and it's very open-ended and it's very, very welcoming. And uh, I've learned a ton of just little tiny tricks that you do that have made a huge difference. So just, just notching things out and doing that kind of stuff. And so it, it's wonderful that you're giving back uh, with this knowledge that you have in such a, uh, genuine, generous way. Well, it's gratifying to me that people find it all useful. Yeah. I have to admit, um, all, all of this comes as a result of a lark. Um, it's like a dare. What, what happened? Well, I mean, you know, the way your life goes without you expecting it, yeah. uh, it all started from writing writing magazine articles, but that started on a tour bus. And um, the bass player walked on the tour bus and said, I just got a job writing for the music paper. The music paper was a, a weekly paper out of New York that had everything about music, and it was the Bible. Hmm. And for some reason, I thought, you know, if you could do that, so can I. So I put some feelers out, and the first job I got, it wasn't a job, the first assignment I got was... Um, to do something for Mix, Mix Magazine. Wow. And that 
kind of went from there. And next thing you know, I was writing for like 10 magazines, 10 different magazines, industry and recording magazines. And then um, that led to, you know, the Mixing Engineer's Handbook. And the Mixing Engineer's Handbook was strictly because I wanted to learn something. I was a pretty good engineer, a recording engineer. I wasn't a good mi mixer, but I knew the people that were. I knew the best. So I went and I interviewed them, and that turned into the book. And at first, everybody said, you can't write a book on mixing. I mean, this right. just goes to show you. They, they, back then, they said, it's intuitive. It's subjective. Nobody can write a book on mixing. But um, it turns out you can, and um, it was a hit right away. So uh, that you know kind of changed the course of my career, became yet another career. It's been really interesting. I've done hundreds and hundreds of interviews with people for um, magazine articles primarily, all sorts of different things. So like I said, I, I knew a lot of people, so it was easy to write books with people that know a lot more than I do. And I, I bet people were pretty open to uh, you coming in and asking them questions about mixing and things like that. Uh, I, they were probably pretty open to share their experiences and uh, you know, be a part of your book, right? You know, I asked, that was a question I would always ask them. I, it was, aren't you afraid of giving away information? And everybody would say to me, no, because nobody can do it like me anyway, which is absolutely true. Yeah. That's funny. It's sort of like a, you know, a dance instructor. They can teach you how to dance, but you're going to put your own flair to it. Yeah. So that's, that's awesome. So you've written a ton of books, right? I mean, how many books have you written? Uh, 25. Okay. Not all in the music industry, but 25 total. And the fact of the matter is, when you consider second and third and fourth editions, you know, that's, I've been through the process about 60 times. So I'm good and at it, it now. Has it always been with the same publishers? No, I'm self-published now. Okay. I've got three different publishers. Mostly because I was lucky. I, the first book I I actually wrote it before I had a book deal and I sent it out to five different publishers. There were actually five publishers in the industry at the time and they all wanted it. Wow. But there was one in particular that was really aggressive and um, the guy's Mike Lawson and he became my champion and, and, and advisor in the business. And every time he moved to a different publisher, I moved with him. Hmm. So that's how I, I, you know, had multiple publishers. And then finally it got to the point where it's like, well, I can do this myself. So that's the way it's been for like four or five years. And do you find, I mean, obviously because you, you've already done it, you know what they did for you, you were able to figure out the, the machinery that they put together for you, right? You know, publishers, music publishers are exactly like record labels. They're excited about things for about two weeks you know, on the release, and then they move on to something else. Right. And that's exactly what happens. So you, you find that you wind up doing a lot of your own promotion anyway. And, uh, you know, the, there was kind of the black art of, well, how do I do this? Do I have to get books, books uh, out printed and then sell them out of my car or what? But now, you know, with Amazon and Ingram and Cortex and all those, it's fairly easy. Yeah. 